with the microphone on to get this done, take care of it first. Got me on now. Can you hear me? It is green, isn't it? Yes. All right. Thank you for being here. Hey, got a lot of family sick today. Tom and Sally still out. Sally has it now. And uh, let me see. Cindy's out. And uh, several others. But anyhow. We're glad you chose to be here and that you're healthy enough to be in the house of God. If not, go home. All right. But anyhow, <laughs> but, uh, we trust you've had a good beginning of a brand year. I've had a great week this week. Prison twice, uh, Friday night and Thursday, some people saved. And, man, I've had a good week. I just had a great week. I hope your week has been as good as mine, all right? But uh, we thank God for you being here today. And those of you watching online, we certainly praise God for you. Uh, showing up and uh, having us tuned in. You know the good thing about being an internet preacher? When you watch me at home, you turn me off. Amen? And just walk away. <laughs> Not as easy to do that when you're here live, but anyhow, we are glad you're here. I want you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. Don't forget the birthdays. Good night. You have them in your bulletin, and I want to wish all of you listed today there. Uh, let me see. I'll go over it. Uh, Maxine Hunt, 90 years young, bless her heart. Still driving. That's sort of scary, isn't it? But anyway. <laughs> That's awesome. Denise Ware, only 75 years old. But anyhow, uh, Ashley Moran, and uh, happy birthday to you. J.R. and Jackson. In fact, that whole family has nothing but birthdays in January. That's crazy, isn't it? All born in the same month. And uh, so it must have been a good month, all right? But uh, don't forget the ladies' uh, breakfast at 9.30 at Rouse. It's listed here. We'll follow it. Uh, yes. Prayer breakfast is going to be this coming Saturday. And you wouldn't know that because you already printed the bullet. We didn't bother you with it. But because we had to postpone it last week due to the fact of ice, and we didn't know we wanted to meet again this Saturday, we just decided, hey, we'll just meet on an odd bar Saturday. So... It's always the first Saturday of the month, but we're going to meet this coming Saturday and pray together, fellowship as well. So don't forget that if you would. All right? And let me see. Good night. Valentine's banker for the ladies' widows who will soon be right around the corner. And uh, we worked that out, I think, this week, hopefully. And we'll take care of that and give you more details if it's not already in the bulletin. But anyhow, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 44, verse 47. We've been preaching, let me see, since the beginning of January, first Sunday in January, a little mini-series, if you want to call it that, on uh, more to soar in 24. And uh, we ought to want to soar for God, shouldn't we? We ought to want to keep going higher and higher, getting better and better. As the old preacher said, getting gooder and gooder. Getting bad grammar, but it's still good truth. And uh, we ought to want to try to seek to be, uh, as particularly the first point has been over the last beginning today and last Sunday, uh, we ought to desire to be more faithful to him. And uh, we're going to look at that again and finish that hopefully next week. But Matthew chapter 5, which is in honor of reading God's word, chapter 5, beginning in verse 44, going to verse 47, Jesus says, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love ye, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. The text verse is the last verse. What do ye more than others? More to soar in 24. I don't know about you. I want to have a great year in 24. Amen? Amen. Not for me, but for God. Amen. And I want to be more productive. I want to go more. I want to be in more prisons. I want to see more accomplished here. And that will be our desire. Never be satisfied where you are in your position or in your growth in the Lord Jesus. And so we ought to desire to be more and get better and better for our God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that we can come and fellowship together. Thank you for this church and this church family. Thank you for God, Miss Sandy, being back today. God, touch her in a very special way. I know it's difficult. I've heard 
time and time again. Difficult when you first come back. Uh, after uh, losing a loved one. And so I pray, continue comforting and giving her all sufficient grace daily, the days ahead and weeks and months until years transpire. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name today, the Holy Ghost of God will touch this preacher. God, use me in some way to be a blessing, to be an encouragement, to be a help, maybe to a home, to a family, to a marriage, to some online. But God, use me today is a tool in your hand. And Lord, without being in your hand, I'm nothing. And so I yield to you all that I am. May you be all that you are through me today. And may you touch me again by your spirit. And Lord, we'll thank and praise you. May again, if there's a soul near his tail, save them for Christ's sake. And we'll give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, and all of God's church said, Amen, amen and amen. You can be seated. We shared with you last week that God admires or rewards us for our faithfulness. God wants us to be faithful. Uh, when you think about God, you will judge faithfulness at the white throne. I mean, at the, uh, the beam of judgment, the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. It will be the one thing that we will take away from that particular judgment. It's not on the judgment on how to get into heaven. That's already settled. Amen? Amen. It's on what did you do for me, with me, after I saved you for uh, Christ's sake. And uh, so that's the judgment. And then there's a second thing we share with you. Not only is there a reward for faithfulness, but there is a requirement by God for us to be faithful. God puts a premium on our faithfulness. When you read and study the Word of God, how God always rewarded and blessed faithfulness in the lives of people. Think about Noah. Suppose he hadn't been faithful in building the ark. We wouldn't be here, by the way. Are you with me? Uh, so thank God for the faithfulness of men. Daniel down in uh, Babylon and on and on. Jeremiah and some of those great giants of the Bible. What was the, the prime thing that made them great? In most cases, every one of them were faithful to God. Though it was difficult at times, and by the way, times hadn't changed. Sometimes it's hard to be faithful to God. I understand that. I've lived my Christian life 53 years. It's not always easy to be faithful to God. But I'll tell you what, it's always the best and most rewarding thing. Amen. Amen? Amen. And so we need to understand God requires faithfulness. More of it is required in stewards or Christians that a man be found faithful. And God wants us to be faithful. We looked at last week, beginning of the marks of faithfulness. How can we identify faithfulness in the lives of people? How should we or where should we uh, excel in being faithful at or with? And last week we began sharing with you the first thing that we need to be faithful in is regarding maritally. And I know that's misspelled, by the way. My fingers don't always hit the keys. I'm a picker pecker, all right, when it comes to typing. And, uh, but maritally. Uh, the I ought to be in between the R and the T. All right. Marshall, yeah. All right. I know. Don't, don't have it. I called it to my, I already called it out myself. All right. I saw it, and I meant to change it actually this week, and I still failed to do that. But anyhow, maritally, uh, God wants us to be faithful. What does that mean? Hey, we need to be faithful to our mates. We need to be faithful to the vows we made, no matter how many years ago it was. We need to be good husbands. And more than good husbands, we need to be godly husbands and godly wives and godly Christians in the home. Hey, your home, nobody sees what your home's like except God right. and you. All right? I've been amazed and appalled at some of the things I have later heard in counseling sessions. What goes on in some quote-unquote Christian families and homes? I mean, same cussing, same uh, fighting, fussing, and feuding. And that just ought not to be in a, a Christian home. Man, if, if two people are saved by the grace of God, they ought to be able to get along. All right? Absolutely. Hey, my wife and I, when, hey, we have never fussed and fought in all the years we uh, have been married. Now, you can hear us discussing things a block away, but I'll tell you what. <laughs> but I'm only kidding. I, I try not to raise my voice ever to my wife. Uh, I've learned long ago, if I don't want to fight with her, I just leave and go out. That's why I've been spending so much time outdoors. Amen. amen. <laughs> but anyway, merited. We ought to get along. If you can't get along as Christians in the home, right. then God have mercy. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong. Your spiritual life is not what it ought to be. If you can't be faithful in the home, as I shared last week, uh, man, you're not going to be faithful to God, period. 
And if uh, someone said, hey, the homes of America are in trouble, they really are. Mm -hmm. Seriously in sincere trouble. And uh, that's the reason we got so many problems today in society. The new generations, with each generation coming up, I don't care what you want to name them, millennials, uh, I don't even know what they are, the got to haves and want it right now, whatever. Whatever you call the generations, the reason they continue, and I'm not picking on them, I'm just making a statement, and I'm not preaching anything, the TV and news and psychologists aren't telling us. we got some problems with the new generations. And the reason those new generations are like they are is because there's a problem in the home. All right? Homes are in trouble. Preachers years ago, he says, the home goes, so goes the church. As the church goes, so goes the nation. Mm. How many of you remember back a few years ago? And when I say a few years ago, I'm looking at probably at least 30 or 35 years ago. We had preachers on TV that made a difference politically. Yep. To turn the tide of this nation. Remember that? Oh, yeah. That's not happening today, friend. And it hadn't happened for a while. Uh, the wrong ones have been in power a lot more in the last few years than it used to be. Come on. Amen. Are you understand what I'm saying? Can I tell you what that's a sign of? The decay of the church. The decline of the church and its power <laughs> to influence others. Here's what the church has done. Seriously. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, we are not to be conformed, but rather we're to be transformed by God. That's right. And when we've been transformed by God, we ought to become transformers to society. But because the church has chosen, listen to me, the churches today have chose to conform, they now have lost the power to transform society. Yep. Think about it. You think our society is better off than it's been in a long time? <clears throat> Horrible. I mean, things that are tolerated, things that are seen, and good night, public education is going totally awry. Horrible. I mean, where kindergartens can be taught, and, and they can bring transsexuals in a kindergarten class and parade them as being normal. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I'm telling you what I know and what's been told by the media. And uh, that you'd have drag queens on television. Prime time. You say, how do you know? You watch it. No, my wife does. But anyway, <laughs> you know I'm only kidding. You know, I've seen it advertised. It's the only reason they always think. <laughs> does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? And I know they're just sinners like I am. I'm not picking on their sin. I'm just saying, who would have dreamed we would have the mess in America we've got? But when you drift from God and you drift from that book, you can't expect to have a better society or a better nation. And I'll tell you what, that's also the reason why we're not doing too well financially right now. Anyway, that's not even my sermon. Good night, I'm running a tangent. I gotta watch that. But anyway... <clears throat> Divorce is declining, as I shared with you last week. But however, living together has become the most precedent. All right? So divorce rates may be not declining because we don't have any times uh, people say, we have a gay couple in our community and they just broke up. So that won't be recorded. All right? And, uh, but, I mean, I'm just telling you what I know. But, uh, so divorce is... Uh, is, is improved. But you know the thing that shocked me most, and I shared this with you last week, is that the highest increase of divorce rate in America is among senior citizens. 55 and up. That's a shock, isn't it? Think about that. What's the point? I can give you several reasons why. Number one, they quit working, have any purpose, some, so many of them. They're at home more. And by the way, when you put two people in the same room and they're there almost 24-7, there's going to be some friction. Amen. Okay? Amen. If you think I'm all the time saying, oh, sweetheart, I love you dearly, deeply, 24 hours a day, you're nuts. <laughs> we don't fight and we don't fuss, we don't cuss, we don't rant and rave. But do we disagree somehow? Absolutely. All right? You can't put two different personalities in the same, under the same roof and not have disagreements. Right. Ain't, ain't, I'm going to use an ain't, ain't going to happen. It's just part of marriage, part of life. It's what you do when those times come. 
And how you do? My, I, like I told you earlier, I just leave and go outside. They come in and spend a lot of time outside. But anyway, but uh, so we need to realize that uh, homes in America are in serious, serious problem. I shared this with you last week. I'll repeat it for those online, those of you that are new here today. Why is divorce? They, they, they wrote down why their divorce occurred. And they could have multiple answers because sometimes it's usually multiple reasons divorce occurs in a marriage anyway. First one on the top of the list was a lack of commitment. By the way, that used to be at the bottom of the top ten reasons. I'm telling you what I know. I preached on series of homes for years and years, almost every year of my ministry. And it used to be at the bottom about commitment. But you know what's happened? A lot of less commitment today. To marriage and to church and to everything. Come on. Second reason, they said 70% infidelity. 55% physical intimacy problems in their marriage. 53% said uh, uh, financial or money problems. And on and on it goes. Sad, isn't it? But it is. The whole needs revival. But it won't have revival until the church experiences a revival. Uh, one of the sad statistics is among the church and in the church, divorce is common in the church and the church is as a whole. I shared with you last week, uh, my wife and I <laughs> married married into her family and she has somebody in her family, a little bit distant relative, preacher down in Lynchburg. How many times have you been married? Four or five times? About it. He's not kids in Oh, no. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well that's true. He was no. kids in your on your suicide. side. But anyway, four or five times already. Good night. He must, he must make it cheaper by the dozen eventually. But anyhow, <laughs> but uh, what we need in America, and particularly in our homes, we need some simplified Christian husbands and wives. Think about that. Always faithful. We need to be faithful at home and marriage. Secondly, last week we just began this point. We need to have faithfulness more than ever in parenting. Parentally, we need faithfulness. I'm, I'll be honest with you, church. I am appalled, and I do mean this sincerely, how many Christian parents there are that disobey and disagree with God's word today on rearing and how to rear children and kids. Amazed. I mean, amazed. Floors me. Uh, someone wisely said, hey, uh, Everything in America is ran by switches but the home. And that's a lot of truth in that. How many Christians, I mean, I've heard it, have heard it over there. I know of, because of being around, I know, hey, can I tell you what? Most men in prison, I preached to, two things about them. Number one, most of them never knew their father. And almost every one of them dearly, deeply had a love like you can't believe for their mothers. We'd ask that question. Those guys have sent a card to mama, but some of them don't know how to send a dad. And even if they didn't know where their dad is, he was so worthless, they don't care a hoot about him because daddy didn't care about them. Are you with me? So what, what, what does it mean to be faithful? It means we gotta, we got to love them. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to show it. There's not anything to be ashamed of to hug your kids. We, we, my kids and I, we don't ever get along. We don't ever get together that we don't hug each other, kiss each other goodnight when they have to go back to Charlottesville or go back to Texas or wherever. And we do it frequently. I love showing affection. That's how it ought to be. Because you need to not just tell and say to someone, we love you, I love you. Well, you never touch a kid. You may wonder if that's true or not. Do you understand that? Do you understand it's been proven that babies that are caressed are a lot healthier, listen to this, mentally, mm -hmm. than babies that are left and mothers care very little about hardly touching their child. Christy came up last week and said, Preacher, let me tell you a story. Preaching on what you preach today. She said, I know a girl in our facility. She deals with this stuff. She said, this kid was in trouble all the time, fighting, mean as a junkyard dog, so to speak. Can I tell you, all of a sudden, she's seen a drastic change in her. I mean, a whole different, I mean, like she almost got saved. <laughs> it's that kind of change. And so she began, I guess, researching, or maybe she told Chrissy, said, why, why the change? She said, let me tell you why. I've got somebody that wants me. 
a foster parent been rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected and not loved and not loved and parents have nothing to do with it, I'm gathering. But because somebody cared and said, oh, we'll take her, we'll, we'll take the problem child, her whole conduct has been changed radically. Don't tell me love, loving your kids and showing and demonstrating to them that you care for them and that you love them. The old bumper sticker I shared with you last week, have you hugged your child today? Have you loved your child today? Amen. Right. And demonstrated and showed it and revealed to them that you love them. Can I tell you why we got a lot of problem kids? Hey, I'll be frank with you. Almost 100% of all inmates in prison, close to 100%, other than the 1% that's innocent, maybe two. Can I just simply tell you why they're there? Family home problem. Something wasn't right in the home from the very beginning. And we're raping it, by the way, in, in America. We really are. So we have to love them. Be faithful to love your child. Your grandkids, by the way. Hey, if your kids won't pick it up, you pick it up, Grandma. Amen? Grandpa. Do what they won't do. Secondly, we need to be faithful in leading them. In leading them. It's hard to lead someone toward God when the followers see the leader not living for God. Did you hear that? There are so many bad examples. Trust me, I, I've dealt with teenagers. And one of the big grumps about, grumbles about teenagers is their parents will go to church, look good on the outside, look good on Sunday morning, but fuss, cuss, rant, and rave like the devil while they're at home. And they just can't get the grasp of why they say they're Christians and yet they live like the devil. You know what I'm saying? The, the two don't, don't fit together. When there's constantly fussing, griping, cussing, and ranting and raving and all that kind of stuff that goes on. And it's always sad. Proverbs 22, 6 is training for a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Doesn't mean they're going to come back to God, but it does say, Here's what that verse really teaches, in my opinion. Because I've seen too many kids go to the devil out of some I thought was good homes. And I, I told you about Wyman Logan last week, one of my deacons in Alabama, one of the best men of any church anywhere I've ever pastored. He and Carolyn were faithful. I mean, they were just, if you wrote over his epitaph, faithful to the Lord unto death, literally. What a man. What parents. Yeah, they had kids that went crazy for a while. And they did come back. But the guarantee is not that they're going to come back. It just simply means when they're old, Pete, that umbrella of protection that you pray over and the verses of Scripture they learn or the preaching they heard both at home and in the pulpit will never, no, never leave them. They can't depart from it. Why? Because the Word of God is still there. Especially these kids that came out of churches, good fundamental churches, that been don't want to memorize, put that Scripture to memory. They'll never forget that stuff. Why? Because if they are saved, it's going to be called by the Holy Spirit. And even if they're not saved, sometimes they're just going to recall. God will recall it to them. And so, man, we need to understand. We need to train up. We need to learn our children. Teach our children. Who has our children more than anyone? Somebody tell me. School. Not actually. <laughs> That's really not true. Figure out the hours. Five and a half usually. The home has them more than anywhere else. But can I tell you what's happened? The home's not teaching children anymore. They're not doing what we need to do while we've got them in the home with the family. That make sense? They're not going to get Christianity in the school unless they're in a Christian school, and then they see all kinds of hypocrisy sometimes even there. Mm -hmm. I'm just simply saying you are the greatest vehicle, the greatest tool God has to help your kids turn out right. But you got to be consistent. You've got to be consistent in what you and how you teach. You see, the problem is sometimes they hear the sermon without seeing the sermon. Do you hear me? They're hearing your preaching, but they're not seeing sometimes the practicing that will go with it. You want to turn a kid off. I mean from leaving little age. You preach to them something that you're not living, or you preach it and not living right, 
they hate and despise hypocrisy. All right? I'm telling you what I've heard time and time again in counseling young people. They cannot stand hypocrites, whether it's their mom and dad or not. They just despise it. So, hey, live your sermon. Practice makes perfect. I remember when I, I, God Almighty convicted me. When I first entered the ministry, I didn't do I didn't do anything right, to be honest with you. And certainly not with marriage and the home and the family. My wife would testify to this. One of the things I did, I got so involved in the work of trying to build a church and win people to Christ, I wasn't home at all. Jacksonville, Florida, first church. And uh, went soul winning anytime I could. Wasn't home, Pete. Kept office hours. My daughter, Leah, did not even know who her daddy was. Hardly. I'm serious. You remember those days? She literally. I'll tell you what spoke to my heart, and God convicted me and got at the beach, and I wasn't dressed to go to the beach. You know how I go to the beach? My wife would tell you. I wore a suit to the beach. And she'll tell you this. While well, her and Leah would go down and play in the sand. I'd be at a table reading my Bible or studying for the next week's sermon or just for myself, my own edification. I never went to the beach to be with my kid. I went to the beach to please me and read or do something, keep studying, keep studying, keep studying, keep reading, keep reading. And one day, I broke away from my books at the beach, uh, Fernandino Beach, actually not far from Jacksonville. And I went out, saw them having fun. I went out to join them, and we started walking, and she was in between us. And somewhere or another, we just let go of her. And I started walking. I walk faster than they did, okay? I still do. And uh, uh, I was walking in front, and I, I realized she wasn't there, and even my wife had sort of got a little bit behind me. And when I turned around in that little wet sand we were walking in, Leah, probably, what, four years old at best? She was doing this. Oh, <laughs> oh sweet. In I want to do it. In my footsteps. <laughs> and I'm telling you the truth. God's Holy Spirit wrote me that very day. Mm -hmm. I said, I've got my priorities all mixed up and messed up. Mm -hmm. Home, my kids, if I lose my kids, I'm not worth mm -hmm. listening to as a pastor. Mm -hmm. If my home goes to the devil and hell, that I'm not fit to listen to, mm -hmm. much less pass the church. Yeah. I'm just telling you what I believe. Read the qualifications of bishop. Mm -hmm. By the way, it doesn't mean one marriage one at a time. <laughs> but anyway, that's another preaching sermon. <laughs> but anyway, are you with me? God showed me i got to change the way I'm living and the way I'm conducting. I thought I was doing right. About getting in the word, reading books, commentary after commentary, going to the beach and having what I wanted to do while they played, but I didn't have that connection with my children. Are you with me? My kids will tell you, I spent time with them. I had to be away some, sure, but I tried to make most of the time them priorities. Okay? And uh, that's what we need to do. Lead them. And by the way, you will teach them more by your leading than by your talking in your conversation. Okay? Then we need to learn them. What do I mean? Let me ask everybody here a question. Why do you think God gave you kids? <laughs> Have you ever asked yourself, hey, well, why did you give these kids? Can I tell you what the Word of God says? He gave them to us for several reasons. Number one, He wants them to be loved by us. He even wants children to be in joy in the home by us. All right? But he gave you kids to teach and to train them and bring them up. Listen to this. In the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Basically, he wants us to teach them how they can become godly, mature Christians. Whole purpose. Malachi chapter 2 says it so well in verse 15. It says that basically, don't despise the wife of your youth, but rather love her. I mean, I'm interpreting the verse of Scripture. Rather love her, and then it says, so that both of you might produce, listen to this, godly seed. What's he mean? What's the purpose of parenting? 
produce godly kids. Can I tell you why a lot of kids aren't godly? Because their parents never were. You know why a lot of kids cuss and rant and rave? Because their parents did. You know why a lot of parents sometimes or kids don't want to go to church? Because they saw the hypocrisy in the home. And they don't want to have anything to do with it. Think about it. And I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm really not. I'm just being... It, it, breaks my heart to see. Hey, you have no idea. Just this week, I got discouraged Friday before going to prison Friday night. And God came. Woo! Hey, God took care of it. Well, I got discouraged because I got a phone call from a chaplain. And while he wanted me to come Friday night to his prison, and I couldn't do it. I already was taken. And uh, so, uh, I said, man, I wish I could. And so we got to talking. We probably talked 30, 45 minutes. One of the best chaplains that I know in the prison system, to be honest with you. And uh, he said, man, we're looking forward to having you in two weeks. And I said, yeah, I'll be there on that Friday night. So anyway, but then while I had him on the phone, I said, how is so-and-so doing since he got out? He said, man, so many of them doing great, preacher. This one, this one, he started naming some names. And I knew who he was talking about. He said, you remember, he was the guitar picker, or he was the drummer, or he was this or that in the church. And I said, oh, wonderful. Glad to hear. And then I asked him about this one particular guy. And he gave me the heartbreaking information that he's fallen twice since he's been out of prison. Not, he's not back in prison, but he got fooling around with the wrong crowd. Got a great job for automotive manufacturing company. And he's got to pay big bucks. And no doubt, according to my son, drugs is infiltrated the plants even in Stewart's draft like crazy. Mm -hmm. Dope pushing goes on there just like it does on the street. Okay? It's everywhere. And that like just broke my heart because he was such a great singer. He made the music for that church. Always faithful. Always up. I think he's saved. Just think he's going to But the good news is, before he hung up, he said, let me tell you the end story. He said, I didn't tell you this, but he'd been to rehab twice. Two facilities. One man himself paid for him to go. But he's under an independent Baptist pastor in a particular town under his accountability. And he is doing well. He's in that church. And he's starting to grow and get back where he was because he didn't want to go back to where he was working and the place where he already made bad acquaintances and uh, he's standing and he's doing better so praise God amen, amen. so no wonder God gave me such a great service Friday night he wanted to encourage me I got that way amen, amen. Deuteronomy 6 6 9 and these words this, this is Moses speaking through the inspiration of God and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. That means you make it your own first, okay? And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy what? Children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way. What does that mean? <clears throat> my kids can tell you, and my grandkids can even tell you now. When they're riding the buggy with me on the back of my place, I'll say, hey, God gave this to us. Look at the beautiful trees. Oh, look at the deer, right? God made that deer. I'm constantly using and trying to elevate God in their eyes. I'm not the perfect parent. I'm just telling you, that's what that verse means. Moonlit night or beautiful sunset. My boys know. I carry them to school every morning when I'm there. And you leave it dark, but the, the sun rises literally to the left of my wife's house. There's a whole cotton field there, and you can see that sun rising. Beautiful. I mean blood sky. And my grandkids can tell you, every morning I carry the school, look at that. God did that for us. What am I doing? I'm letting them know God means a lot to Grandpa, and it ought to mean a lot to them. And that he's Elohim. He is our creator, and he created that. For us. That's what that means. While thou walkest, when you're hunting, my son will tell you, I used to tell him, we used to see unique things in the woods, and I'd say, hey, son, who made that? Who created that so that that animal knows to do that? And eventually he got it right, and God did. Are you with me? My kid's not perfect habits, no, but I tried to obey this scripture. When thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, what do you think that means? I think you ought to have devotion with your children every night before they go to bed. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. And when thou risest up, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand. They shall be frontless before thy eyes. Every Christian home ought to have Bible verses somewhere posted in the, on the walls of your home. 
surprise you. Why? Because they can read the Word of God. Hey, what does the Word of God say? It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. And man, they'll memorize it. They don't memorize anything. And I still remember, in fact, I just came across it, by the way, when I was cleaning upstairs this week, baby. I just came across a picture that sat over the dining room table of my home on Greenwood Drive. And I read it. And I, I didn't have to read it. I already knew what it said. And she had a Bible verse over the table as well. It works. And that's what he's talking about. Write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. The Word of God's got power. And we got pictures of this and pictures of that. Put some scripture up somewhere. Something that says something, that has some meat and content to it. Proverbs 1, verse 8 and verse 9. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace upon thy head and chains about thy neck. What is he saying? He said, if you teach them, if you give it to them, hey, they will never lose it. They'll remember. Surely, isn't it you, surely, that has talked to me about your mother and you still remember her godliness? Why? Because that godly mother infiltrated it into Shirley's life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Things I remember about my, my parents, they never went to bed, they didn't have devotions. Every night I'd come home even when it wasn't the right kind of <laughs> situation for me to come home. I'd get breath tests. <laughs> got caught more times than you shake a stick at you. Gum doesn't cover it. And, uh, hey, I got so bad, I drank uh, aftershave. Ew. I'd come in, I'd smell like J.D. if you remember that one. But anyway, but anyway, that didn't work. Either. Hey, I know why you got that smell. You've been doing what you shouldn't be doing. But anyway, I told another story. But I'm just simply telling you, but man, they go back to their room, and I don't care what time of the hour I got in, they pray. And I hear their prayers from my room because we joined walls. And I used to, I told you this, but I used to cuss them under our breath and hate and despise them. Once I got saved, I was thankful. Thank Amen. God they didn't quit. Ephesians 6, 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He tells fathers ought to take the lead. Hey, two things ought to be done. Number one, there needs to be a father time. I'm not talking about daddy either. I'm talking about the heavenly father. You ought to have devotions with your kids. I know sometimes that may be difficult. It was difficult even for us, even in pastoring. But man, we used to have uh, devotion sometimes at the table, and we have somebody that would act out. But one of the things we did is try to make it fun for the kids. Okay, uh, my grand my grandsons never go to sleep at night without mama being there, praying over them, praying for them, taking prayer requests, and taking thanksgivings every day. Every day, did it while she was here. I used to let me do it some, but I I, I went overtime. Every night. Does that surprise anybody here? Yeah. <laughs> I still get to occasions. She'll call me back here. But father time. Nothing is as valuable as praying with your children over your kids, teaching them the Bible, as well as living it before them. She has a thankful time. What were you thankful? What do you thank God today for most? You'd be surprised what a kid will say. I thank God he let me play with my toy today. And he'll name whatever specifically. Mm -hmm. Or I thank God. Man, they come up with some pretty good things. Grace got a lot better. Thank God I could see today. Or thank God for the sunrise. Or thank God Paul Paul or Granny's here. And especially Paul Paul. But anyway, <laughs> but, anyhow, but father time. Mm -hmm. okay. Did you try to have devotions with your kids when they were little? All right. Do you realize how many tools there are out there? My daughter, come on, come on. Every Easter and every Christmas, she orders offline. And I told her, I said, this is wonderful. They have heard the, the Christmas story and the Easter story so much in so many different variable ways. It's not funny. And they got the pictures to boot. They even got toys, this last one that she did with them. They got to keep the toy that was there uh, presenting part of the story. Cool stuff. I, I, I can't go into all the detail. But there's tons of things. But those things, if they sit on a shelf and never used, they are useless. But make it interesting. Make it exciting. We used to play games every night. 
I always said, all right, now, I'm going to teach your Bible story tonight, and we're going to have devotion tonight, but you better listen up, because we're going to have question and answer session, and for every answer right, you get a piece of candy. We had some great devotion back in our day, my wife and I shared so forth together, but can I tell you what? While we had the devotion, we rotted the teeth out, but anyway, <laughs> had a dental bill, but anyhow, <clears throat> but we try to make it interesting and exciting and fun. doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be just reading a Bible. There's pictorial Bibles, and we use that quite frequently, especially at bedtime. Uh, our daughter has several books similar to that, and uh, I think it was wonderful. Hey, secondly, you to learn them, have fun with them. Make memories with them. Have a family time. What am I talking about? I don't know about you, but we got a generation so hooked up on computers and cell phones, they don't even know who mom and dad is anymore. That's right, I mean, they live on cell phones. I told you last week what my father wrote about cell phones, sex, sex text, stuff that's out there, and it's happening every day. And millions of children are messed up today. By the way, our prisons are filling up in this area because of the mess that's available to little kids Amen. that mom and daddy doesn't screen and have no idea about. Mm. Okay? They're there. So... Have fun with you. anybody here play games with your parents? My mom every snow day. We had to play Monopoly with my mom. Oh, yeah. And then my neighbors boys boys would come over and we'd play and we'd have a ball playing Monopoly. Anybody ever play sorry? That's a blast. Yeah. We used to play sorry. Chinese checkers. My mom was tough to beat. <laughs> but I remember those days of joy and laughter and fun around the table with my family. Does that make sense? My wife can testify. When our grandkids come to our house, one of the first things some of them say, or even sometime while they're there a little bit late, hey, we're going to play games tonight? They love me because I love winning, even against them. I don't give them any breaks. I don't give them any slack. These parents are saying, well, I'm going to let my kid win so they don't get an inferiority complex. Hey! I don't think that's right personally, but anyway. <laughs> Y'all like, well, it doesn't matter if you win or lose. Yeah, it does, too. <laughs> All right, good night. I didn't play baseball to lose. I played to win. Anyway, a whole other ball game. All right? You've heard the old adage in the statement, a family that what? Together. Praise, Praise together. Stay together. together. Let me give you another one that's just as important. Yeah. A family that plays together stays together. Mm -hmm. you hear me? Number four, not only do we need to learn them, love them, but we need to <laughs> lick them. And I'm talking about with your tongue. All right, that's a whole different licking. We well, don't use these terms much today. Back in the old days, they used to use the term, well, I gave them a licking. And uh, how many how many here ever grew up in a home with corporal punishment? Raise your hand. Anybody know what corporal punishment is? Spankings? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my dad used a belt, and I'm not suggesting Wait. anybody ought to use a belt personally. No, mm -hmm. Scripture says explicitly clear and plain in how to spank a child. Clear as a bail in Proverbs. You put them all together, number one, you never do it right after the offense. Okay? You don't grab a child up because he's interfered with your football game and quack, 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 quack. You never use your hand. You never slap a child in the face. That will create defiance against you. All right? But God made it specifically clear. Use a rod. A switch. A paddle works pretty good. Ping pong paddle's pretty good. Hmm. My daughter, my daughter, because of her ex, uh, started using a, uh, what's that ball that you play on the court inside? Good night. I, I was going to play racquetball. Racquetball paddle. Him that thing big. I'll tell you what. My boys, all all you got to do, if they really acting up and you want them to settle down and you want them to behave, all you got to do is look up there and say, hey, you want me to go get that? Man, it's like they got saved <laughs> momentarily. They fear that rod. They don't fear the parent. They fear the rod. Are you with me? That's why you never That's use your hand. That's to caress and to love and to hug with. Are you with me? God is so explicitly clear and plain on how to do it. You don't do it in your hot displeasure. God doesn't do that. All right? And God chases, by the way. And if we want to do chase chastisement with our children right, we need to copy what God does. 
But the proverb says, don't do it instantly. I used to always send the kids back to their room. Mama did more chastening than I did ever. Because she was home more. But she always told me when I get it, well, tonight, so-and-so got it. And she'd tell me why and what and what's for. And then you always spell out to the child before you spank them, this is why I'm doing this to you. Are you with me? And then never spank without praise. A prayer of love and correction and reconciliation. Did you hear me? Mm-hmm. And I'm not touching on all the steps, but I'm just simply telling you. We'd have better kids if we'd practice the Word of God, particularly the book of Proverbs. We really would. It's sad where we are today. Proverbs 29, look at what God says about the rod. The rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself, in other words, one that's never spanked, never, never chastened, bringeth his mother to shame. A lot of that is true. All of it's true, by the way. Verse 13, 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. Whoa! And yet, you know what the reverse is? Parents think, well, I can't hurt my child. I love him too much. No, you don't either. You know what the problem is why people don't do this today? They don't want to be bothered. They think, I'll have better peace in the home if I don't do that. I don't want to hear him cry. I don't want to see him in pain and all that. But God tells us what to do. But what floors me is Christian moms and dads are not obeying this today. They think it's horrible. They swallowed political correctness today. I remember I had a pastor friend back years ago, and uh, he shared the story with me that he was uh, having devotions, family devotions at the table. And his youngest son kept acting out, kept acting up, and he was disturbing the devotion. So he sent him to his room. He went upstairs, and he you know, told him what he did, told him why he was going to do what he did, and he gave him a whipping, gave him a spanking. Are you with me? And so he came back down to continue the devotions. And as they continued the devotion, all of a sudden, he stood at the top of the stairwell and said, Daddy, will you let me come back? I promise I'll obey. And he did. And the little boy walked back down, joined the devotion that had not yet finished, getting ready to. And after he finished his devotion, because of the topic that was being done at the devotion, he turned to his kids and started asking this question, What do you want to be when you grow up? And one little boy, you know, his oldest son, I want to be a preacher, and so forth. The little girl said, and then the little boy that had been went upstairs, he said, what do you want to be? He said, Daddy, to be honest, I just want to be alive. Amen, amen. <laughs> All right? It may be a little bit too severe for the spanking, but anyway. Can I just simply remind you, as being a parent, it's not an easy thing. There's a challenge. It's difficult. Can I be honest and frank? I think it's more difficult than it's ever been. Literally. More difficult than what I did. Some similar things need to continue consistently being done. But it's tougher. Why? Because there's so many more things kids can get in today. Cell phones. Horrible tools. Especially for youngsters. I know everybody's got one just about in school. I understand that. But I'm telling you. We haven't reached the cell phone generation. Completely. That's down the road. I shared this with you last week. There's, a, there's a, a correctional facility only my wife and I go to in the whole state of Virginia. Very few people, most inmates know about it, and they dread having to go there. I do know that. They don't go anywhere but there. But they had about 350 beds max when we started entering several years ago, that facility. <clears throat> Today they just finished building 1,500 beds. Beautiful, immaculate prison. It doesn't even look like a prison, to be frank with you. Mm. And it's really not. It's a rehab facility. Everyone that comes there has already served their time in prison. <clears throat> 15, 20 years, whatever. Then they get transferred there. Not all, just some. Why? It's a sex offenders prison. Mm. You hear me? Mm. What does the government tell, what does the state of Virginia know that we may not be aware of? They're preparing for the future generations yep. to fill that prison. Mm. Because it will happen if it's not already. Because of all the garbage that's out there. You deal with this, I'll bet you. And kids will tell you, hey, let me tell you, I got I can tell you the first time, and I'm just I'm not I'm not I'm not confessing my sin, but I will 
today. I can tell you the exact store. I can tell you the exact place I first beheld the possibility of porn with my eyes. Still up in this stupid brain of mine. Well, it's, been, it's been 53 years, well beyond 53 years ago. I was a kid when that happened. A child. Because back in those days, you didn't have to cover anything. Didn't have to put it behind cameras or anything. And it's probably not that way today as well. Probably. Nothing's changed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Somebody's called the parent between the parent and the child. The generation gap. Can I tell you what? Let's pray that God gives us power. Let's pray that God gives us wisdom. Let's pray that God gives us as not just parents, grandparents, to make a godly difference in our homes and with our kids and our grandkids. Because if we don't strive, we will lose the next generation. If we don't. God help us. Amen? I want to I misspell that too, by the way. I'll correct all that next week. I don't have time to go over this point. Let's be what God wants us to be. Let's try to be more faithful than we've ever been as a husband, as a wife, as a grandma, as a grandpa, and do what God has given us the time while we have the time to do with our kids, child or grandchild, while there's yet hope. I want to hear his bow and eyes closed. I want to ask you a question today. First and foremost, the most important thing, we can't teach our children anything until we first get saved, until we come to Christ. Until we come to the same God, we need to convey to them the importance of. So let me quickly ask this particular question. I ask it each week, I ask it in prison every every week. And that is simply this. Do you know that you know personally that you're in Christ, that you've been saved, that you've been born again by the Spirit of God, and to His gratitude and to His praise and thanksgiving, you could say, I'm thankful, preacher, there's been a time, a day, and a place I know that I trusted Christ as my Savior. And you're glad that that happened to your heart and your life. Would you raise your hand real high? Preacher, I know that I've been saved. I've trusted him. God bless those hands. Everybody in the house, that's a good thing. You can put them down. Thank you. Could I ask you a, a second question? How's your kids turning out? How's your grandkids? Do they love God like you love them? Do they walk in the things of God like you do or desire to do? Hey, we only have them a short time before they leave the nest and our influence to a certain degree is lessened dramatically. But when those grandkids come for a visit, teach them some things. Let them see some things. Let them see how a Christian lives different than maybe what they did at home. Let them recognize there is a difference. My wife here to testify we never get a card from any of our kids. Never. But they don't usually conclude and say, Dad, Mom, thank you for having a godly home and teaching us godly values. I'm not bragging about me. I'm bragging about what God's done for us. What they saw in us. We've not been perfect parents. Nobody is. But we did try by the grace of God and the help of God. Our kids are in church. My son is in Charlottesville in a good church from everything I'm hearing about it. And has been now for several months. My daughter is in that same church in Charlottesville. My daughter's in Midland in a Baptist church that we attend when we're there. A good preacher. I thank God my kids are still solid when it comes to church and trying to do right. Have they failed? Oh, yeah. Have I had problems as a dad and mom? Yeah, everybody does. But you keep plugging away. You keep teaching. Oh, and above anything, you keep praying for them. That God will always guide and lead and direct and keep them close to Him. Make that a matter of prayer in your heart today, whether you're a parent or not. Everybody's got an influence. Co-workers, influence. 
Family that comes occasionally to see you, influence. That they can see Christ in you and in us. And know there is a difference. God help us to show that, reveal that. For those of you online, if you have family problems, marital problems, whatever, hey, and you're saved by the grace of God, get back with God. Get His wisdom. Get His touch to be what God saved you to be. And if there's somebody going to watch this and you don't know that you've been saved, you're not certain that if you died, you'd go to heaven and Christ is your Savior, then we bid you to trust Him. Consider Him today. You say, why? Because God loves you. The Bible says you're a sinner. And if we die in our sin, we have to pay our own penalty and go to hell, the Bible says. But the good news is there's somebody paid your way in full by his own blood. The Lord Jesus Christ died for your sin on the cross, became your substitute, your sacrifice, your payment, so that you could be forgiven of your sin. He died so that he could give you everlasting life. He took your sin so he could offer you forgiveness. He tasted hell in your place so that you could experience heaven and go to heaven. Would you like this, Jesus? Would you like to trust and call on him today? The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, might, hope so, think so, maybe so. It says, shall be saved. Delivered to and from. You're delivered from sin to forgiveness, justification, salvation. You're delivered from death to eternal life. You're delivered from hell to heaven. That's what salvation is all about. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. But thank God you can receive it. Because it's a free gift of God. But the gift of God is eternal life. And the one that paid for your gift is Jesus Christ. The rest of the verse is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He bought it in full, paid for it in full for you. All you need to do is receive it. Take it. For the gang member Friday night, get saved. I mean, he had tattoos. He so tattooed, couldn't only see his face. Came and gave me a big bear hug after he got saved and thanked me for being there and for showing him how he could trust Christ. Can I ask you, friend, you can do it right where you are, in your home, you may be driving, or pull over the side of the road, and bow your head and give your heart and your life to Christ and trust Jesus as your Savior. Say, I would know what to say. Would you pray something like this then? Dear God, I understand that I've sinned against Thee. Not worthy of your love, your grace, but I do understand. God, you love me so much that you gave Jesus, your son, to die for my sin on the cross. I believe that he was buried. I believe that he rose and conquered death, hell, and the grave for me. And today I trust only in him and invite him to come into my heart my life, forgive my sin, and be my Savior. Thank you. God for loving me. Thank you for saving me and forgiving me. Help me now to live for you. In Jesus' name. Hey, if you've done that, there's some information on the screen. You write us. Let us know here on some of this address that you got saved. You trusted him. And we'd be glad to send you a little book that we give here and in prison, for that matter, called Hitting the Mark. We'd love to send that to you. Post it's free. All you got to do is write for it. And it'll help jumpstart your newfound faith in Jesus Christ. Father, today, thank you for these who are here today and for those who are sick. Touch them and help them to be well very soon and back joining us. We do pray, God, for every parent, every grandparent in this room. God, help us to be all that God in 24 you need and want us to be for your glory and your honor. Lord, we influence people every day we're around, shopping, family, neighbors. Help them truly see Christ living through and in us is our prayer. And we'll praise you. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you.